Greetings and salutations. I'm Theo Shoup, the host of The Many Hats of Coco. We're coming to you today from Tsunami Books. Thanks, Scott, for having us in Eugene, Oregon here. Today we host another, uh, an author of memoirs. Uh, I've read much of Bill Sarnoff's work and his reminiscences are delightful studies on the human condition, uh, wry and succinct. Bill offers vignettes of, of insight with a, uh, with a twist of humor. Bill, care to join me? Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Have a seat. Thank you. So as I mentioned, I've read quite a number of your memoirs, and they're just, they're just so much fun. Uh, give us a little background. Why, uh, why did you start writing memoirs? And what? Well, uh, good question. Um, I, um, number one, I had spent a career in marketing research and finally retired. And about four years ago, I decided, why don't I try creative writing? And most people who write memoirs will write things of a, a terrible past and dramatic past. And I decided I'm going to take a different perspective. I'm going to write with humor. And so I, I remember that just as a kid, because I w grew up during the Depression years, and, and I remember my parents were very poor. They could not afford to buy us a sled. And we had to slide down the hill of my fat cousin. Okay. And she was very good. Love that a lot. And lard was the high price spread when we were growing up. And when we were growing up, my brother, sisters, and I, our family had a samovar. A samovar is really a, a, a tea brewer. You fill it with water, and the center is hollow. There's a hollow tube. And you put a, 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 a charcoal uh, spires into it. They, we didn't have cubes at that time. And we lit it up from the bottom, and it kept the water hot. We had mugs, big heavy mugs that you could wrap your hand around it. And you filled your mug with water. And on top of the samovar was a little uh, 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 faucet with uh, loose tea in it, um, a, a sort of a miniature teapot. And the charcoals kept the tea hot, and you just filled your glass with water or your cup with water, and you added uh, the tea to whatever strength you wanted it. And the family would sit around the samovar, and the extended family would come over every Wednesday night and Sunday afternoon, and they sit around the samovar and talk about the old time and the old days. And I remembered most of them. And, and so when the time arrived, I decided to put it down on paper. And I called this Around the Samovar. And it's a little bit different, I must tell you. Um, I might tell you that uh, typical of my stories are that uh, my grandmother brewed Slivovitz. Slivovitz is a plum brandy, as you might know. <clears throat> and so uh, when the old folks would come by on Wednesday night, uh, they would sit around the samovar drinking Slivovitz. I tell you this story because um, uh, they had spent the evening talking, speaking of whatever they wished to speak about. And now it's about 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. All had the part in. They had gone their own route. At which, and now, this was the Midwest, Chicago, which was a very cold place in December. And there had been a storm. <clears throat> there had been a snowstorm. And, and everything was coated with ice and all had disappeared, gone for the night. It was about 11.30, almost 12 o'clock, there was a banging on the door. And my father put his overcoat on and his galoshes on, and he opened the door, and it was Shemshel, the glazier. Shemshel put windows in, is that it's what he did. And my father said, go home, there's no more Slivovitz. Uh, maybe next week we'll have some more. And <clears throat> Shemsel said, I didn't come for the Slivovitz. I came back for my crutches. That's the kind of 
humor that 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 surrounded us. Um, one other that sat around uh, was my uncle, an uncle who had come here in 1910 and had uh, arrived in in uh, uh, in Houston, Texas area, and. Um, they, they had they had found oil at that time in 1910 and so he worked in the oil fields he was a, a carpenter and they built these derricks out of four by fours and six by sixes but oil ran out and his name was Albert Albert had nothing to do and so things were so bad he lived in a rooming house and he wrote back home to his family if they would send him fair he would return because there was no work for him at all and every day he'd spend stand out on the porch on the street looking for the postman to bring him some money so that he could go back home and it never arrived well he got to know the postman and he started walking the postman's route with the postman and he said what kind of job do you have and the postman said this is a civil service job it's working for life and and i'll get a pension and so albert said i like that how do i become a postman and albert said you go down to the post office and you apply to the postmaster and so albert ran down and he got in line and he came up to the postmaster and he said i would like to be postman and so albert gave him an application form and he said fill this out and leave it here and albert looked at this at the application form and he said, I don't read English. And the postman looked at him aghast. He said, you don't read English. How can you be a postman? Go home and come back when you learn to read. Oh, he was so despondent. So from the post office, he walked through an abandoned oil field. And there was a 20 foot length of cast iron pipe that had been tossed away. He put one on his shoulder and there had been uh, a, a scrap metal dealer and he brought that and he got a nickel for that 20 length hunk of pipe. Albert ran right back out again to the same field and put two on his shoulder and he got a dime. And he finished the day just hauling two on his shoulder. The next morning he hired, he rented a mule for 50 cents and a, and a cart and he loaded up the cart and he brought a whole cart load this time he got a dollar and 20 cents yippee he was on his way a year later he wound up buying that scrap metal dealer in houston texas mm -hmm. then he decided things were working well he found a partner who was a greek immigrant like Albert from Russia, but this fellow was Greek, and he spoke, he read, wrote English. And so they became partners in the real estate business in Houston, Texas in 1911, 1912. And afterwards, they moved to Chicago, where he went into the real estate business, then out to Los Angeles, and they became partners in real estate. I tell you this story because when I got married, Albert invited me out to his house in, in LA, in the LA area. And we were there for a, on my honeymoon. And we were there for a couple of days and Albert said, Willie, Willie, I have to go to the bank and, and I have to look at papers and you finish college, would you come with me? And I said, sure. And he came with a paper bag, and there was all sorts of things in that paper sack. And we got into the bank, and uh, the banker said, what can I help you with? And Albert said, I'd like to make a real estate loan. I'd like to apply. And Albert said, do you have any backup? Do you have any back any, any, any collateral. resources and collateral? <laughs> And Albert opened the paper bag and spread out deeds to four pieces of property. He wanted to make a loan for $280,000. This was 1951. 
And the banker said, no problem. Just fill out this application form. And Albert picked up the application form and he gave it to me. He said, read the words to me. I'll tell you what numbers to put down. Hmm. And the banker was beside himself. He said, I can't believe what I'm seeing here. Here you are asking for a $280,000 loan and you do not read English? He said, I can't imagine where you would be if you could read English. And Albert said, I'd be a postman in Houston. <laughs> and those are the kinds of stories that I have around the sem Semmelweis. Okay. And there's 300 and some pages of those stories. So I decided to tell about those years, which were not happy years or, or productive years, but there was always humor in it. That's wonderful. And, uh, you know, having read your work, uh, I, I, I attest to how wonderful the stories are. I also have to commend you for your writing. Uh, it just, uh, I tend to uh, stay away from memoirs because so often everybody has wonderful stories. Everybody has wonderful lives. Uh, putting it down on paper is, is a chore that not many people can do. Uh, and I was just enchanted with your writing. On that note, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd like to hear you read something for us. Sure, uh, sure. And we can I see can. How, just how delightful your reading is. I think you have something marked in these. Oh, yeah. I'll read from my second book. This is what I remember. And the cover is, I was a paramedic. I was, but I really wasn't. I was a marketing research uh, guy for a company that made paramedic equipment, uh, spine boards and oxygen and, and uh, esophageal airways and bandages of all sorts. And so um, in order to know my product reasonably well, I had to become a para a, a, an EMT. Uh, an emergency medical technician so that I could visit the field and see how our products work. I was an EMT for four days and as a matter of fact that while I was rummaging around here I found my old badge uh, when, when I, I, was, I, I finally got my uh, badge and I, I have it with me and here it is. So I was an EMT for four days, and I want to share a couple of experiences there. I, I, I want to say real quick that you, in those four days, you also got a very nice picture out of the effort. Okay. His EMT badge. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So you're going to share something with us? Yes. yes. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to share my opening story, um, and here's how it starts. I am in an urgent race against the erasure of memory. For that reason, I have gathered assorted experiences free of sentimental throat clearing that remain clear enough to share. Sooner or later, everybody sits down to a banquet of memories, and this is what I remember. And so my cover has a picture of me and my associate, her name was Ellen, and there was a, a, a paramedic, a senior guy, and so my four days there was kind of interesting. Um, I, I start out by saying, let me share this with you, here it is. Um, Heart and pulse thumping, siren screaming, speedometer hovering at 92. We're responding to an emergency call. And an emergency call, and that one was in the desert east of Escondido, California. And the call was that a man had stopped breathing. And this was on a Tuesday morning. <clears throat> and so it was raining worse than it is today here. And so we came barreling out, couldn't find the place, finally did. It was just a little shack. And we walked in with, with our uh, uh, equipment. And uh, there was an old man on a couch, lying on a couch and he was ashen gray and charlie charles the head of our uh, paramedic said uh 
when did he stop breathing? And his wife said, yesterday afternoon. <laughs> so we backed out. Now we're heading back for Escondido. And we get a call. <clears throat> there <clears throat> is a young mother uh, delivering a baby in the back seat of a car at the play field, at the baseball play field. Can you respond? Now we're going all the way back through the desert, through Escondido, through the west side, and we saw the red car. Uh, and so there it was. However, there was a gully between our van and the red car. So Charlie said to Ellen, who is on the cover, Ellen, grab your first responder kit jump over the gully, we'll bring the van down, we'll come over and we'll come up with the gurney. And Ellen did exactly as she was trained. She jumped over and there was a very heavy set woman laying in the back seat and so she took her scissor, which we all carry, and slid her dress and her underwear to get to the birthing process. Well, Charles and I had to go way down, came up. Now we come through high grass hauling our, our, uh, our, our gurney. And this woman is now standing clutching her clothes and screaming at Ellen and screaming at Charles and screaming at me. It was the wrong car. <laughs> <laughs> it was the wrong car. <laughs> and that's the kind of life we lived in. So we got back, we got back to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the uh, office, uh, to our center, and uh, got to chatting with Ellen. And I said, Ellen, what got you into this work? She said, I can tell you. She said, I've just ended my second marriage, and anything that has to do with tires and testicles, I'm going to have trouble with. And so she was a school librarian, and they had lost their budget, and so she was out of a job. So she volunteered for the fire department as a cadet, and she would bring water or coffee and donuts and on the big fires, and, and uh, ultimately she took the same course that I did, became an EMT. And I said to her, we were in the day room, coming back from this birth process, <laughs> and I said, Ellen, what got you started in, a, in this? She said, well, I, I just was floating on a career, and I didn't know which way to go. And I said, yeah, but you put your life in danger. You're running into fires and out of fires. She said, yes, that's true. She said, and because I must tell you, once in a hundred, I actually save a life. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, maybe I'll save my own. Mm -hmm. Ellen, mm -hmm. she was my partner. <coughs> I have 71 other stories like that in this book, 50 in this book. Can so I have, I have a quick question about that yeah. story. What happened to the pregnant woman? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> well, uh, um, very simple. Uh, the the, uh, the um, emergency service, the police department, gave her a credit card for Macy's in downtown Escondido <laughs> to buy well, there a you go. new outfit. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So you wanted to share with us something else then? Okay. Um, I, I have another story called um, a, a Taste of Romania. We had in my, my part of Chicago a furniture store that had gone out of business and it was bigger than this beautiful bookstore and it had been empty for a long time. And the, the, uh, um, there was a, 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 what do you call it, a um, Romanian family. And they were, they were immigrants like everyone else. They bought the building. There was this huge store, high ceiling, and four apartments above the store. They gutted the apartments, made of it a sort of a banquet hall. Down below on the main level, they made it a Romanian steakhouse. A wonderful, wonderful place. And they were smart enough, they hired violinists 
uh, Bella, Cornelia, and Nikolai, and they, and they had them wear uh, tuxedos, and they would get up on a little platform and start their beautiful, beautiful classic violin music, and they would stroll around the restaurant, and they would end up back on the little platform. Well, they were sold out, and they were just a marvelous, marvelous success. I tell you this story because they had, uh, they had built, put in a huge chandelier they got from some castle, and it, re and it had murals on the wall, and it really was a beautiful place. Now they had banquets. A banquet, you know, a whole four or six people around, and there was a banquet number six in the back of the restaurant, sort of secluded, and they had received a, 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 a reservation request for banquet number six. And there was a couple there, and they were having just a good time. And I described the restaurant and the people and, the, and, and all of that and all of that. And um, uh, Cyril was the waiter, a friend of mine, and he told me this story. Banquet number six, way just in the way, there was a couple that had made arrangements from Hyde Park, Illinois, Chicago area, which is a long distance away. And they were having a wonderful, wonderful dinner. And Cyril, the waiter, no noticed that the man was slipping down and slipped up the banquet and to the table, and he called his father, who owned the restaurant, and his father went over and said to the lady, Madam, your husband just slipped down onto the floor. And she just stood and stared there, and she said, No, he didn't, he just walked in the front door. <laughs> and those are the kind of stories that we share and make you understand. And uh, I have many more if you'd like to. Actually, Bill, I just got the the uh, the uh, notice that we have uh, just a few minutes left. I, uh, and I'm sorry, we just have a few minutes <clears throat> left with you. But if you have a short one, we'd love I to. I have a very short one. Lovely. It's about three minutes or even less. Okay. And Sounds it's wonderful. Navigating the seas. Here's a scene: a woman, 62, 63, whatever, a widow, alone for three years, and she had girlfriends. And for the very first time in her life, <clears throat> she was going on a cruise by herself. And so they had a big party Saturday night, and they all wished her bon voyage, and Sunday morning she left. And so she had a laptop, and she kept in touch with this little clique of her friends. And so she decided and promised that she would keep them up to date on what her days were like. And this is what she clicked, very short. Sunday, thank you all for the surprise Bon Voyage party yesterday. It's about, it's been a challenging two years since Martin's passing, but here I am in Fort Lauderdale waiting to board my ship for a Caribbean cruise, my first ever. As you suggested, I did drop in at the Lilac and Lilies, the trendy boutique shop on Sunset Boulevard, and really splurged, okay, Monday, uh, Sunday, Monday, she emailed, uh, to the lunch gals, I'm not going to let Martin's illness passing caused me to be a recluse any longer. I'm going to fluff out my tutu, unwrap my dancing shoes, and dance away to a live shipboard orchestra. Yippee! Spent the entire day on the open sea at poolside. Thank you, Corinne, for coercing me to join your Pilates class. I love it. Tuesday, she emailed. We're heading to Cozumel. Weather is magnificent. Played shuffleboard at poolside, lunch on the outdoor Lido deck with three roaming violinists performing a perfect unison playing Hungarian and old world classics. Sweet. Ship's navigator strolled by and said hello and joined me for an exotic and sweet herbal tea. His name is Oliveto Gio Tenerelli. 
so attractive, I think, to be cooped up all day with his blinking GPSs and monitors and steering levers. No sign anywhere of a helm's wheel, not even a miniature one. Wednesday, she emailed to her lunch gals, had my hair done, massage, facial, the works in the chef's elegant beauty salon. Real spendy, but their staff of Indonesian stylists are truly superb. I like my new book <clears throat> and, and, and read it on the deck. Oliverio happened to pass by through and invited me to join him at his table for dinner. <clears throat> he is quite attractive in his Chris uniform, and I am comfortable with his easy smile and manners. A far cry from Martin's ongoing criticalness of the world. He called me Canarino all through dinner, which he told me means canary in Italian. I had a wonderful time, and he, <clears throat> he invited me to spend the night in his cabin when he came off duty. I declined. <clears throat> What would my children think? Thursday, we're on our way for the ship's next destination at Half Moon Key, a private island owned and, st and, and staffed by our cruise line. An impressive <clears throat> barbecue spread, never-ending supply of rum and cokes, Cayman Island singers and musicians in Oliverio. He had several had several drinks together, spent the balance of the day strolling the beach hand in hand. He stopped abruptly and told me he was madly in love with me. I had had to have me. He had to have me, saying it on and on. He insisted I join him and his suite on, on board and got very emotional, saying, if I refused, he would run the ship onto the shoals with all 3,200 passengers. I was shocked. It was a dilemma I had never faced before in my life. Friday morning to the lunch gals, last night I saved 3,200 lives. <laughs> Twice. Bill. So much fun to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.